is an internationally recognized health and medical writer, consultant, and lecturer on addiction. He has created courses on addiction at Cape Cod Community College and writes the popular Cape Cod Times advice column on addiction. He is also the author of the booklet, Up in Smoke, and the book, Addicted, a guide to understanding addiction. Now, Tom O'Connell. Hi, welcome to Understanding Addiction. Today we're going to talk about drug addiction. It's a major national and international problem. Interestingly enough, most of the deaths and in injuries to, due to drugs are due to legal drugs, alcohol and tobacco, for example, and also prescription drugs. Uh, the illicit drugs are a major concern, but if we spend most of our time thinking about them, that would be a little bit like only focusing on hit and run accidents on the highway and ignoring all the rest the, that are bothering people's lives. So it's a very complicated subject. Uh, what we're talking about when we're dealing with this complicated subject is many possibilities for addiction. We're talking about work addiction possibly, we're talking about power, relationships. Food, there are all kinds of addictions, and drug addiction is just one of many addictions. Today in the United States, just for some statistics to give you a feeling for the problem that we have today, there'll be about 50, 15 to 20 people who will probably die today due to drug addiction. There will be another 350 that will die due to alcohol problems, and about 1,000 people will die today due to nicotine addiction. And when we talk about addiction, we're talking about certain basic things. And one of the, the core issues in addiction is the notion of obsession and the notion of compulsion. So this is what I call the OC of addiction. When I talk about obsession, what I'm thinking about is the way of being haunted by an idea or preoccupied by it. And when I talk about compulsion, I'm talking about being driven to do something about that thing that we're preoccupied by. Now, when we're hung up or hooked on illicit drugs, what we're thinking about is something that we have to do and that we feel compelled to do it. In the United States, George Gallup, uh, doing one of his opinion surveys, found that about four adults in 10 in America are in contact with a user of drugs or a seller of drugs at any given time. And about a third of the teenagers in America are involved with drugs in some way, and it affects people in all walks of life. It's, it's an equal opportunity problem. Why do we do it? Why do we turn to drugs and other substances? We want to feel good. We want to change the way we feel. So we do it for pleasure. We do it for pain relief. We do it as a rite of passage. We do it for stress reduction. That's a very common reason. And we do it to alter our moods. What does this trace back to? I think it traces back to the human condition itself. And when I think of the human condition, I use some initials S-A-A-H to describe this. Being born puts us all in the same situation. We come out of a comfortable place in the womb, and then from then on, we tend to be a little bit anxious about being separated from those we love or some things that we love, and we also want to be attached or connected, and we develop what I call attachment hunger. I think of this as a longing of the human spirit to connect. It's a natural thing, and that's what sets us up for being addicted. We find something that we like, we don't want to be separated from it, we want to continue the behavior, and we become attached to it, or connected. And then not too far beyond that, we become addicted. Another notion that I, that I consider when I think about addictions is what I call the ISM. And the ISM of addiction is the, the, the idea of being very insecure, super sensitive, and moody. And when you are around addiction and you meet enough people who have been suffering from it, especially drug addiction and alcohol addiction, you find that they're very insecure and they're super sensitive and they're moody. And they may have started out that way, but the drugs make them more so. And that's what makes recovery difficult. There's another definition that I'm 
I've really become very attached to, and I call this Dr. Gitlow's definition of addiction. And he, he describes this as a disease in which any technique for adapting to the problems of life is used other than interpersonal relating. So what Dr. Gitlow is saying to us is addiction is a relationship substitute. Instead of relating, and that's where our health comes from, relating to situations in our lives, relating to other people, relating to our higher power, we end up relating to a substance that changes the way we feel. And it becomes chronic and addictive. Another, um, when I think about addiction, I'm also thinking about another definition, which is traces back to ancient Rome. And when, when, in ancient Rome, they had a word called, a phrase called ad dictum. And that meant like a prison sentence or a kind of bondage. And in Latin, the word addict comes from the same word that means devoted. So when I'm thinking of addiction, I'm thinking of a kind of devotion or a worship of, and it starts with experiment, becomes habit, becomes dependence, and then leads me into addiction. I'm thinking of a disease process. So another useful definition that I use is that addiction is a condition of unhealthy dependence that impairs my ability to function to my full potential. It's a, it's a disease process, it's a disease problem. And it starts with discomfort. And then to relieve my discomfort, I turn to this behavior that makes me feel a little better. And, but the hitch is it impairs me. And it, 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 turns me into a, it turns me into a human problem instead of a human being, actually. And we have so many ways of doing this with drugs. We have stimulant drugs like cocaine and speed, the, the uppers. We have depressant drugs such as alcohol and heroin. Heroin is becoming very popular today because it always follows cocaine epidemics. When people realize they're getting burned out from the uppers, they end up turning to the, the downers. And that's what's happening to us in America today. Marijuana is another depressant drug. Tranquilizers are depressant drugs. And then we have the mixed effects that people get when they use prescription drugs and combine them with alcohol and cocaine all adds up to a very dangerous situation. And it, what it is really is what I call dependence with a capital D. And in, when we're dependent, which is addicted, then we're in a state of suspense. We're feeling tension all the time. When will I get my supply? When will I feel better? We're, we're feeling pain, physical or mental pain, and we're in a state of unhealthy dependence. Another way of saying we're addicted. Drug actions. Drug actions tend to follow patterns. When I take a stimulant drug, it excites me or it agitates me. When I withdraw from it, my body goes to the opposite. So when I'm taking stimulants and I stop them, I become depressed. When I'm taking sedative drugs that depress me and I stop them, I get the opposite effect and I get tremors. For example, the alcoholic taking a depressant drug stops drinking and starts to get seizures and tremors. That's what happens. The body is always trying to find balance. It's called homeostasis. The body always wants to find the middle ground. Unfortunately, the brain circuits are being short-circuited when we take drugs. And it's affecting our, not only the brain, but the central nervous system. And in the medical world, they call this an insult to the brain. And this especially happens with drugs like cocaine and the uppers. It also ha happens with other drugs, too. So we start with urges, we get craving, we get negative moods, and we turn to our drugs for relief. And this forms a kind of a cycle, and I call this the addiction cycle. It begins with discomfort, we look for relief, we anticipate our love object, we find that we, we're changing our mood and we're either getting high or we're getting low, or sometimes we're getting mellow. And what we're really doing, we're escaping reality. And we're looking for relief from reality. And then when we withdraw from the drug, we get uncomfortable again, and on goes the cycle. So we're dealing with cycles of activity and cycles of behavior. And we're talking about the physical, the mental, and what I call the PMESS of addiction. And it's the holistic aspect of addiction, the physical, the mental, the emotional, the social, and the spiritual aspects of addiction. It involves the whole being. There's no part of us that escapes when we're addicted. And in severity, it ranges like any other problem in life. You know, you can be mildly diabetic, moderately diabetic, or severely diabetic, and that's what happens with addiction, too. It's a curve. And then there are phases. Sometimes people use substances. Sometimes they misuse substances. 
Then there's what we call non-use. We don't have to use substances. And there's dependence on substances and eventually there's addiction. It's a process and I call this the addiction process. And it begins with experimentation, feelings change, habit forms, we become dependent, we're addicted. And some of the factors to remember when we think about addiction, are, one of them is allergy. One of the factors to remember is allergy. We become allergic to the very thing we take too often. It alters our energy. That comes from the ancient Greek. We become sensitive. We develop sensitivities. And very often we're disposed to take certain drugs or to relieve certain pain that we have. And we develop tendencies. And all these factors are part of the addiction process. I want to mention tranquilizers because we spend so much time talking about illegal drugs. Tranquilizers uh, are in an amazing abundance in our society and throughout the world. Most popular are the benzodiazepines and these are usually called Valium and Librium. And then we have the sedative hypnotic drugs that are also very popular. And the problem is when we withdraw from these drugs we are still set up that we may end up with panic attacks, rapid heartbeats, blood pressure problems, memory problems and seizures. So there's a high risk from every kind of drug that we can take whether it's alcohol or opiates or you name it, there's always a high risk. The body wants peace, the body wants some kind of regularity, the body wants the middle ground. And when we push it too high or push it too low, we're putting the body in jeopardy. Illicit drugs, another thing is the purity problem. We're playing Russian roulette. <clears throat> when, we're, when we're taking illegal drugs, we have no idea whatsoever what's happening to us or what the power of the substance is that we're taking in. And when people put together designer drugs, there's absolutely no knowledge of, of what's in them. So we're really playing Russian roulette when we're taking drugs, especially the illicit drugs. This leads me into what I want to describe as some of the symptoms of a, that go with addiction. I call it the five C's. And the first one is craving. I really crave this substance. I want to change the way I feel. And then there's compulsion. I need to do something about it. And then there's control. I want to be in control, but then I'll, I'll end up losing control. And the, in spite of that, I continue the behavior despite the life-damaging consequences. And this is the basic problem situation that we run into with addiction, the five C's of addiction. Uh, marijuana, I'd like to talk about that a little bit. Sometimes called cannabis, the official name. Ten years ago, uh, the joint of marijuana was similar to two light beers. Today, it's anywhere from 200 to 1,000 percent stronger, and you can't tell how strong it's going to be when you start taking the joint. So it's much more dangerous today than it was 10 years ago. And there are also some 400 different chemical compounds when a marijuana joint is burning, and thousands of secondary chemicals that are coming into our bodies. And then there's the risk that it might be laced with PCP and other dangerous substances. So we have to be aware of this. Marijuana addicts tend to be a little soft on their habits and they don't like to think, them, think of themselves as addicts. They say things like, I don't smoke every day. The hitch is the substance goes into the fatty tissues of the body and the person is constantly intoxicated even though they're only taking a joint every few days. And it has effects similar to alcoholism, memory problems, energy problems, productivity problems, apathy, very big problem in school systems, apathy, low grades, errors in judgment, mood swings, and paranoia. So is marijuana a problem? Is it an addictive substance? Yes, it is. It does bodily harm, it does emotional harm, and it stunts our growth emotionally and spiritually. Cocaine. <clears throat> Cocaine has been with us for a number of years and it's still with us to some degree. It comes from South America, usually other parts of the world, similar to caffeine, morphine, nicotine. It's an upper. People use it to increase their energy. The purity, again, is a problem. Um, it can be anywhere from 10% pure to 90% pure, so a person just doesn't know what they're taking. And it has, there's a, another popular thing going on today, which is using cocaine to lengthen the effects of alcohol. And so what, what they're doing, playing a kind of a chemical engineer behavior, where our, our pharmacologist behavior, and trying to extend the high very dangerous process. Very often when the cocaine wears off, the person ends up late at night hitting a tree on the highway because they're suddenly so intoxicated they can't even drive. Cocaine. Since the late 1800s, um, there was a cocaine epidemic then, and eventually it was followed by a heroin problem. And here we, we're going through the same cycle again. 
In the 1980s, it was the number one emergency hospital admission. And um, interesting point, 93% of cocaine users used marijuana first. So we have what we call gateway drugs, We're using one drug that's not quite as serious, but then that leads us into experimenting with the next more serious drug. So that's one of the dangers of, of experimenting at all. Uh, in, in the 1980s, it became highly available, and that's what led to the epidemic. It goes to the brain very fast when it's smoked, and it, it, it puts a person in a state of ecstasy, and the, why it's so reinforcing is you want to re, recapture that ecstasy, and that's what makes a cocaine addict difficult to, uh, to rehabilitate. It's called one of the most enforcing or, and rewarding drugs. So, Cocaine, what does it do to us? It, it, it destroys mood stability. You know, Mood-altering substances, mood-altering mood substances uh, change how we feel, and cocaine really changes how we feel. It triggers depression, insomnia, paranoia, violence, hallucinations, suicide, and impaired judgment. Is that enough to keep people from using it? Once addicted, none of these warnings are enough. Uh, it's, it had, there are physical problems, seizures, itching, vertigo, pneumonia and then problems of the GI tract, malnutrition, heart rhythm, one of the most dangerous problems. All kinds of other stuff goes with cocaine use. Uh, vitamin deficiencies, ulcers in the nose, high body temperatures, respiratory failure, and brain hemorrhage. Dangerous drug, not one to be experimented with. Uh, this leads us to what I call the CPF of addiction, and this is true of cocaine and all of the other substances. When we become addicted, we tend to have a chronic situation that stays with us, and also progressive means it gets worse with time. The situation won't stay on a nice plateau and, and just rest there. It tends to get worse and potentially fatal. This is true of all the, the, all the drugs and all the addictions. They are potentially fatal. Cocaine, what about a cocaine user? How can you tell if someone's using it? Well, one of the symptoms, energy bursts, incredible bursts of energy. Um, another one, changing friends a lot. Grandiosity, big ideas, you know. Uh, borrowing money, a lot of borrowing money, which may lead to stealing money. Um, a decrease in self care, you know, taking care of one's body and one's mind. A lot of absences from work. Uh, nasal irritation, nose problems, uh, and weight loss also goes with it. In the personality, they, they can be very confident, extremely talkative. Uh, highly sexed. Uh, all kinds of bizarre sexual behaviors go with cocaine addiction too. And cocaine addicts can often be on power trips and they're into control. They want to control the way they feel and they want to control what's happening around them. In withdrawal they can get symptoms that are very similar to Alzheimer's disease. So we've got a, a situation in our country where I'm hoping that we're going to see a trend downward, but the hitch is that when the trend for cocaine starts to go downward, which it seems to be doing, we're now getting a trend toward heroin. Once an addict, the tendency to be addicted always remains there. Just the question is, what are we addicted to? And we'll change that unless we enter recovery, which is a, another journey. Uh, in cocaine re recovery, one of the experts, Dr. Herbert Kleber, describe what he called drug hunger. And coming off cocaine, this lasts for many days, and there's a kind of a crash, a deep depression, unbelievable depression, that would make a cocaine user who stops using feel very suicidal. And to help people through that stage, they use tricyclic drugs, a lot of psychological support, and they make contracts. The, the people who work in the healing fields make contracts with that person. Uh, and if their behavior does a certain thing, they have consequences that come up, like notifying the employer. Uh, exercise is, is a wonderful thing for all recovering addicts, and a lot of education about the behaviors that trigger the need for the substance. You know, what is it that makes me feel a certain way and it makes me want to turn to that behavior? You know, is it when something goes wrong at work, when something goes wrong at home, whatever the situation is, that's the kind of stuff that we need to learn in recovery. And recovery, I think of as a journey. I don't think of it as a, as a situation that where we stop drinking, we stop drugging, and suddenly we're okay. This is a kind of a mythology that people who don't know any better think. When you stop taking a drug, you end up starting a whole new adventure in living, and it requires a complete change of the way one lives. And so I, I discuss what we call the recovery realities. And when I get into recovery from drug addiction, 
or any addiction, what I need to do is start working on the way I think. And I have to start changing the way I think. And I have to work on the words that I use. And I have to use positive words and affirmations, and I have to use good words. And I have to think about my actions, even the smallest actions that I have. And I have to watch how I act and how I react. And so what that means is I have to be fully conscious as a human being about my existence. I have to be conscious of how I think and how I talk and how I act and how I react to other people. And this is a journey. It's not a simple journey. It's a journey that requires a high level of awareness. And what happens to a lot of people in recovery is they become so sensitive to life and it becomes so painful to them that they want to go back to the previous behavior. But those people who end up staying with it and accepting those temporary periods of pain end up recovering from their addictions. And they end up, to, they end up being able to face life even though life includes both deep pain and a lot of joy. One of the problems in the, in the addictive mentality is that we tend to want to go for the joy, you know, the gusto, the fun, and we tend to not want to face the pain, the sorrow, the grief in life. And in recovery from addiction, we learn to accept life as it is, as it happens. And that's a journey. That's not something that just takes place and it's suddenly over and done with. It's, it's a journey for the rest of one's life once we stop our addictions. We no longer turn to substances to change our reality. And the key to recovery, I think, I call it the key to recovery, is what I call the healing of the human spirit. So how do I heal the human spirit? The human spirit is healed through the use of love and truth. And so where do I get this love and truth? Well, in ordinary life, it's not so easy to find. In the workplace, it's sometimes difficult to find. Um, in all of the aspects of life, we sometimes seem to lose the connections that we need to, to nurture our spirits and to make us feel better. And so when we're talking about the healing of the human spirit, what I'm saying is that when my spirit is uncomfortable, then that's when I tend to turn to my addictions. And so when I move away from an addiction and I want to heal my spirit, my recommendation is recovery groups, support groups, where you have other people who have the same problem, sharing their stories, sharing the pain and suffering they have, sharing the joy that they have, and then by, by sharing that and becoming more open and honest and kind and loving, and more concerned with how we think and how we feel and getting in touch with feelings and getting to really know ourselves, we get in touch with love and truth. And those are the two most important aspects of living. And so once we get in touch with love and truth, we, we don't want to go back to our behaviors. We don't want to be addicted anymore. We want to be in touch with the real stuff, the real pain, the real losses. And we don't want to stifle that pain. We want to feel it. We want to know it. And we also want to feel the real joy. We want to feel the good stuff in life. And that's, what, that's the difference between being addicted and being in recovery. And in recovery, I have something I call the road to recovery. And it's a pretty basic process. Number one, the hardest thing of all, admit the problem. It's hard to admit a problem, any problem at all in life. The second step is surrender to the reality that I am addicted and have certain tendencies and that I need to do something about them and then get help. Get help through friends, you know, through agencies that are available like councils on alcoholism and drug dependence. Get help, key item, and then change the behavior. Well, it's easy to say change the behavior. It's one of the most difficult things in life to change behavior. Changing habits requires brand new habits, and that's a journey into itself. And so in this, what I call the recovery journey, we have ways to do this. We have the self-help groups. We can turn to therapy of all kinds. And what happens to us? We end up with new insights into life. We end up with new habits, good habits instead of the negative ones that are life destructive. We end up with new values. We think more in terms of kindness and love instead of fear and greed. And we end up with a new freedom. And it's a wonderful freedom. What kind of a freedom is it? It's a freedom to be oneself and to find out who you are and to love yourself and learn to love other people and not walk around in fear. And the fear is what, what pushes us into the drugs and the other addictive behaviors. Teenagers 
Uh, one of the main problems with teenagers, the bodies are still developing. If they become addicted, the addiction is much more severe at the early ages. And also we end up with apathy and negativity, discipline problems. What do the teens need? It's pretty basic, but it's not easy. They need limits and they need responsibility, and they have to get consequences for their actions. They, have to, they, they need consequences, they have to understand that. Uh, one of the problems, they deny that there's a problem, and they also deny that they're mortal human beings, and that they're at risk for death. They, they believe they're gonna live forever. And, yet, and on the other side of it, the suicide rates have more than doubled since the 1960s. And, and I attribute most of this to the use of drugs, which put a person into such, deep, uh, such a deep depression that you want to end your life. And that's what's happening with a lot of teenagers today. Um, some other factors relating to addiction, the D, D, T, and W. It's a very important item. And it's, it's just that we tend to defend what we're doing or deny it, I don't have a problem. We develop tolerance, which means that I need more and more of the substance to get the same effect. And then the awful, serious withdrawal symptoms. And essentially, we're gonna close with some of these notions about triangles. And we, essentially what happens with addiction is we're involved in a series of triangles. Um, the triangle is, goes the S yes in this series of triangles is the self at the base of the triangle, and then the A is addiction. And what happens is addiction separates me from myself, the two S's, and addiction separates me from others, the O, and it separates me from God, the G. And in that sense of separation, that's when I'm losing myself, and that's when I'm feeling all kinds of pain, and I keep going back to the substance over and over again, and I'm still separated, I'm still alienated. Well, in recovery, what happens is we, we dissolve those triangles. And so in the recovery process, what we end up doing is finding ourselves in a better relationship with ourselves, in a better relationship with other people, and in a better relationship with our higher power. And then there's a, this is the process. So we're talking about recovery, a relationship with self, a relationship with others, a straight line relationship, honest relationship, loving relationship, and a connection with our higher power or our God. So in addiction, what are we doing? Well, simply we're trying to fill a kind of inner emptiness, and that's a triangle of a kind. And in that triangle, we're trying to fill something that can't be filled with substances and food and sexual activity and all the other stuff we think makes us feel good. It's a bottomless pit. And the spiritual solution is to realize that only a spiritual way of life can fill that emptiness that we get when we're, we're, we're human. We, we're, as a human being, it's natural to feel uncomfortable. But the solution isn't to stuff ourselves with all kinds of substances and mood-altering things. The solution is spiritual. In other words, recover the human spirit. You know, get in touch with who we are, learn about, as I said, in recovery, love and truth, and then realize that those are the ways to feel better. Those are the ways to, to relieve our discomfort. Like, for example, being unselfish, being concerned with other people. So, when I talk about recovery, basically, it's a journey. It's not an event. It isn't something that just happens and it's over and done with. When we stop the addictions, we're at the beginning of a completely new existence that will last the rest of our lives. And it's a wonderful journey. It has ups, it has downs, it has middles, but it's real. And so on your journey, what I wanna do is wish you the best of, not so much luck, the, the best of reality is what I wanna wish you on your journey through life, recovering from your addictions. And thank you for being with us on Understanding Addiction.